I warmly welcome all participating state agents to the EAB's 2017 CPD program, which is being presented by uh, contact sessions, e-learning, and also a new innovation that we're hoping to launch in the second part of the 2017 year. I'm really gratified at the wholehearted support from professional estate agents that the EAB continues to receive where CPD is concerned. The CPD requirement is prescribed by the EAB both as the statutory regulator of the sector and also in fulfillment of its professional body obligations. It is to be underscored that CPD is an ongoing process that will continue throughout the career of a professional estate agent. CPD indeed is essential for ensuring the continued knowledge, competence and retention of skills in any profession including of course a state agency. It is axiomatic that the desired outcome of the major objective of any CPD program is threefold, namely to protect the consuming public, to safeguard the professionalism of the sector and to ensure that a successful professional career of choice for estate agents. It has always been self-evident to me that the estate agency sector is a dynamic and continually evolving one, remaining informed of and being conversant with such factors as the latest skills, knowledge and industry trends is therefore essential if real estate professionals are to remain relevant, meaningful and probably just as importantly successful. I am convinced that the EAB CPD program as it has developed over the past two years is sufficiently focused to provide the necessary tools and content to ensure professional property practitioners are able thereby to develop and enhance their professional skill sets in relation to both long-term career plans and identify professional goals in an exciting career of choice. CPD is an essential mechanism that facilitates the demonstration by property practitioners of their ongoing commitment to keeping themselves informed of the sector best practice, whether for the benefit of the stakeholders, consumers, peers, and frequently current and potential future employers. In my experience, some of the many benefits attaching to the EAB CPD program include the fact that CPD ensures the capability of a state agency professionals to keep pace with current standards and developments within the estate agency sector. CPD ensures that practitioners maintain and enhance the competence, knowledge and skills needed to deliver a professional service to clients, stakeholders and the community at large. CPD ensures that the knowledge of professionals is always relevant and current and that practitioners are made aware of new developments and changing trends and directions in the state agency sector, bearing in mind the increasing frenetic space of change that is currently being experienced. CPD not only assists professionals in the sector to make a meaningful contribution to a state agency in general, but also to become more effective in the workplace so that they may advance their careers move into new positions and ultimately lead, manage, influence, coach and mentor others entering into the sector. CPD helps property practitioners to remain interested and interesting by creating and focusing on potential new possibilities, knowledge and skills areas. CPD can inculcate a deeper understanding of the professionalism of a state agency sector and encourage a greater appreciation of the implications, aspects and impacts of the services rendered by property practitioners. Interactive CPD advances the body of knowledge and competencies within the estate agency profession. CPD invariably results in increased public trust, confidence in and respect for individual professionals in general as well as the estate agency profession in particular. CPD inevitably contributes to improved consumer protection as well as a sustainable increase in the economy as a whole. It must be accepted that CPD represents a career-long obligation 
for all practicing estate agency professionals. I believe that on a cost-benefit analysis, there can be little doubt that the benefits accruing both to estate agents and the consumers they serve resulting from the professionalization of the sector far outweigh the cost that are necessarily incurred. The EAB, with this in mind, will continue to strive to ensure that CPD compliance is not regarded as an onerous obligation imposed upon estate agents, but rather as a meaningful and valuable learning experience that provides food for thought and further inquiry and research while simultaneously enhancing the professionalism, competencies and productivity of property practitioners. I am confident that our CPD program for 2017 will meet these goals and obligations. In conclusion, I extend my very best wishes for the prosperity and success to our professional practitioners in 2017. I hope and trust that they will find CPD to be interesting, relevant and helpful as they continue to play their vital part in advancing the professionalism of their careers in the estate agency sector. Greetings to you all watching this presentation. My name is Graham Jay. I am the managing director of a company called the College of People Management and Development, or CPMD. I will be doing this presentation on financial management, which forms part of the State Agency Affairs Board's series for CPD training. You will see that my contact details are on the screen. Should you wish to get hold of me, my email address and our web address is also displayed. What we're going to be doing during the course of this presentation is to have a discussion regarding the following. I'm going to talk to you about the accounting cycle. We're going to have a look at how certain accounting principles are applied. We're also going to have a look at the way in which we would budget for an estate agency, the maintenance of financial records. We're going to talk a little bit about how we would go uh, about interpreting financial statements and we're also going to have a look at some month in reporting issues. To start off with, <coughs> the nature and role of accounting, so just some definitions for us to be aware of. What is the role of accounting? The role of accounting broadly is to produce financial reports for a particular economic entity. We know various different types of trading entities will produce financial statements on either a monthly and certainly on, a, on an annual basis. And what do we use these financial statements for? Well, we use them to make informed decisions. So we need to be able to study the financials of that particular entity and then make decisions based upon the information that is presented to us and displayed. There are various users of financial information. <clears throat> these users include primary users, and secondary users, broadly, how, we, how would we distinguish, distinguish between these users? Our primary users would be users that are internal to the organization. So that would include uh, management, for example. Um, it may also include our accountants and auditors. And secondary users would then be the people that we give that particular information to. So that could be SARS, it could also be investors. Um, it could be uh, partners of ours and so on who would be wanting to uh, obviously view the information and use it to make their own decisions. So what is accounting? Well, accounting is broken down into a number of different, uh, number of different steps. Primarily, the starting point with accounting is we need to classify and record our transactions. In fact, largely, that is the bookkeeping process of accounting. <coughs> So to start off with, we're going to classify and record our transactions. We've got to have some way of doing that, and that's going to be the bookkeeping process in terms of money. In fact, one of the downsides of accounting is that we can only record things that can be reduced to monetary terms. For example, the value of our staff, we cannot put into our financial statements. And with most businesses, our staff are most important. Those of you watching this presentation will be aware, certainly for your uh, agency or your brokerage or staff would be the most important people. They are the ones that are doing the work, but you cannot classify them in your financial statements because you can't reduce them to monetary terms. So we have a process of classifying and recording transactions, which we reduce to monetary terms in the books of account. That would be, as I've indicated, 
the bookkeeping process. So the actual recording and classifying of transactions would be our bookkeeping process. And then what we need to do is summarize, report, and interpret the results. So the summarizing and the reporting, which would be the actual creation of the financial statements, that's going to be the accounting part, and then obviously the interpretation of those results. We need to be aware that there are certain underlying assumptions that we make when we look at financial statements and also when the financial statements are put together. And there are three, three important assumptions that we generally utilize. The first is what we call the accrual basis or the accrual concept. So here what we do is we work off of the, off of the assumption, and it's not necessarily an assumption. This is what is done in practice in real life. Transactions are reported in the period in which they are incurred or in which they, uh, which they actually occur. So that means that all incomes and expenses are reported in the period in which they are earned or incurred, even if not necessarily received or paid. So what we do is we match the transaction to the period. We don't match the transaction to necessarily when the income is paid or when the, when the income is received rather or when the expense is paid. The second thing is that we make the assumption that the business is going to be a going concern, certainly for the coming financial year. Obviously, if there's any chance of the business closing down, then our accountants or auditors would highlight this. And this you would generally see right at the beginning of a set of financial statements when the auditors uh, indicate what, what, what important things people need to be aware of in, in their particular report. And the third thing is what we call the entity convention. The most important thing that we need to understand, and sometimes this can be confusing for people who are not aware of how this works, is that for a company, as an example, the shareholders and the directors do not form part of the company per se. So what we do from an accounting perspective is we separate the business's assets and liabilities from the owner's assets and liabilities. It's important that we don't mix the two, and hence we call it the entity convention. In other words, we view the company, or perhaps you may still have a close corporation that you're dealing with, okay, or even a trust, as a separate entity. It's not one and the same with the particular uh, owners or shareholders of that particular business. So those are our three important assumptions. The accrual basis, we match all transactions to the period in which they occur. We work from the assumption that the business will be a going concern for at least the coming year. And we also ensure that we separate the business's assets and liabilities from those of the owners. So if you have a look at the next slide, you will see that I have graphically illustrated what we call the accounting cycle. Uh, it's going to be very difficult for me to go through each particular step of the accounting cycle. So I'm really going to talk about the cycle in general terms. You will see that there are six steps. We land up okay, at the end uh, with step number six. This process is a circular process or something that happens on a cyclical basis that happens every single month and then on an annual basis. So where we start is with all of our transactions. You'll see I've said deposit fees, okay, just as our example. So as an agency or brokerage, you would generate a certain amount of fees. We then record those transactions in what we call the books of original entry. The first book of original entry would be our journal, and that's where we're going to get all of our debits and credits. Okay, and please, those of you uh, watching this presentation, I know that you're probably going to be saying to yourself, this is why I dropped accounting at school. Uh, you don't need to worry about how the debits and credits work, but just be aware that uh, the, these transactions need to be recorded and it's done by means of debits and credit. What we then do is we take all of our debits and credits and we summarize them in what are called our ledger accounts. At the end of each month, we then need to create a trial balance. A trial balance is merely a list of all of our debit and credit balances that come from our ledger accounts. From our trial balance, we're able to then generate our financial statements. So the two statements that you would be most aware of would firstly be the income statement. And today, the proper terminology that we should refer to an income statement as would be a 
um, a statement, a statement of income or a statement of comprehensive income, and then we have a balance sheet, uh, or what we refer to today as a statement of financial position. Let's talk a little bit more about these two statements. What does the income statement demonstrate to us? If we just start with the definition of the income statement, the income statement shows us the results of trade over a particular period of time. So when we talk about the results of trade, what do we want the results of trade to be? Well, ideally, obviously, a profit, but it is possible that we could also be making a loss. You'll see that I've indicated here the basic setup of an income statement for two different types of organizations. Okay, the first is for a fee-based entity, and you'll see the income statement is really pretty simple. Fees, less expenses, gives us net income before tax. Okay, so our income, less our expenses, gives us net income before tax. On the right-hand side, this would be the basic setup for an entity that sells stock. So here the difference would be instead of fees, we refer to sales. We then subtract something which we call cost of goods sold or cost of sales. This, in essence, is the cost of the stock that we have sold. How do we calculate that? We take our opening stock, we add any purchases that we have made, and we subtract our closing stock. So this calculation over here will then give us our cost of goods sold. Sales is cost of goods sold gives us a figure which we call gross profit. Gross profit, less expenses, gives us net income before tax. So what we're trying to do with our income statement is we want to work out, so what is the result of trade? What's the end result of having conducted business? And as I say, hopefully we've made a, a profit before tax, so we've got net income before tax. Just remember the income statement today we refer to as a statement of income. Um, I still like the old style terminology of income statement because it explains really what it is. The balance sheet or our statement of financial position consists of two parts. The top part, those are all of our assets. The assets are what we own or what the business owns. This consists of two different asset classes. We have our non-current assets or in old style terminology fixed assets. That would be things like our land and buildings and our furniture and equipment and then we have our current assets. This would include any stock, debtors, and money that we have in the bank. We then add up all of our assets. We do the bottom half of our balance sheet, which is our liabilities and equity. This is what we owe. So we will have certain creditors, people that we owe money to, and equity. Equity is the money that the owners have put into the business. It also goes under the liability section of our balance sheet or statement of financial position. Why is that? Well, very simply, if the owners have put money into the business, they're entitled to get money back. But of course, the money that the owners have put in, their claim against the business is not the same as an ordinary creditor. So what should, what should happen, and it's not always the case, because sometimes there are errors that are made which we need to sort out, is that the top part of our balance sheet, all our assets, must equal all of our liabilities and equity, hence we speak about a balance sheet, right? because the two parts would balance. Again, as I've indicated, the terminology today that we use is a statement of financial position. Why? Because it shows us our financial position, it demonstrates our financial position. What are our assets? Who do we owe money to? And what is the amount of equity that the owners of that business have? So you'll see I've just summarized this for you on the next slide. So we have a balance sheet or statement of financial position. We have an income statement or statement of income. There are two further statements that you may very well uh, be exposed to or become aware of. That includes a statement of changes in equity. So that's a statement that's provided in the financial statement which, which indicates how the owner's equity has changed over the particular period of time under review. That may be any monies that have been put into the business, any monies that have been taken out, dividends that have been paid, for example. And the last statement would be the cash flow statement. The cash flow statement shows us the effective movement of cash through the business. That would be cash that's come into the business and cash that's gone out of the business. It has to be actual cash movement. So one of the big differences between the income statement and the cash flow statement 
relates to this concept that we referred to earlier, which we called accrual. So the income statement, we record all of our income, even although it may not have been received. We also record all of our expenses, even although they may not have been paid. Those incomes and expenses will not be recorded in our cash flow statement, because it's not actual cash in or cash out that has moved through the business. So hence the, the difference between the two statements. Cash flow statement showing actual movements of cash into and out of the business, whereas the income statement is drawn up on the accrual basis or using the accrual concept. Let's have a look at these statements in a little bit more detail. Some of these things I have mentioned already, uh, but uh, we just, just to go over them again, our income statement or our statement of income, so what does it do? Uh, it shows us all our revenue and all of our expenses. So our revenue, okay, this would be at the time of a legally enforceable sale. Remember we referred to the accrual, the accrual uh, concept or the accrual assumption that we draw up our financial statements using. So all revenue that is generated, regardless as to whether it's received, must go into the income statement. Our expenses that have been incurred also need to go into our income statement. Once again, the time of receipt of revenue and the payment of expenses is immaterial. The fact that it belongs to that period means that it needs to be recognized in that period. When we take our revenue and we subtract our expenses, we can then determine whether we've made a profit or a loss. Our balance sheet or statement of financial position, so as we've already indicated, contains the following. We have all of our assets. And just to remind ourselves, remember that we have two classes of assets. Firstly, we have our non-current assets, which we also call fixed assets. Our non-current assets really would be part of the infrastructure of the business. So that this would be any land and buildings, motor vehicles, uh, possibly uh, computer equipment that we may have that forms part of, of the total backbone or infrastructure of the business. Then our current assets. So usually our current assets, we have three main types of current assets. This would include any money that we have in the bank, any money that's owed to us by our debtors, and if we are carrying any stock. Obviously for an estate agency or brokerage type of business, there wouldn't be stock as such as you would have with, uh, let's say, um, a retail entity that's selling groceries. Our assets must equal our equity plus our liabilities. So our liabilities, we're going to have non-current liabilities as well. The, di the distinction between a non-current liability and a current liability is that a current liability will be repaid during the course of the coming financial year. So this generally would be our short-term creditors that we would refer to, and so these would be our monthly accounts that we need to pay, as opposed to our non-current liabilities, which would be long-term creditors. This would include things like long-term loan obligations that the business may have. <coughs> Owner's equity also forms part of the liability section of our balance sheet or statements of financial position and as I mentioned to you earlier as well the owners have put money into the business therefore they're entitled to get their money back so to a certain, certain, uh, in a certain respect they're almost like creditors of the business. So really on an annual basis what we would be trying to do is to increase the value of the business and really increase the, the value that the owner is getting out of the business. So that may be through an increase, for example, of non-current assets or even our current assets, a reduction of our current liabilities. And obviously, to make this equation still balance, it means that owner's equity uh, would have to increase. Obviously, for a type of trading entity that an estate agency or a brokerage is, Certain of these items are less important. Uh, Non-current assets, as an example. One may be renting premises as opposed to owning premises. One doesn't have a factory because you're not manufacturing anything. And so, in that respect, uh, what would be important is the amount of income that is being generated. That we would record, obviously, in the income statement. And the profits that we make, it would then feed through into the owner's equity section 
of our balance sheet. So our owner's equity would go up every year if we're making more money. Let's talk a little bit about accounting for, for different business forms or different business entities. So our main business forms or entities, first of all, we have a sole proprietor. So some of you watching this presentation may operate as a sole proprietor. This would be where you have a single owner of the business. Here we have no legal separation between the owner and the business. So earlier when we spoke about the entity convention, so that's going to be a problem for a sole proprietor because the sole proprietor is the business. So either he or she would be the business and that can sometimes create some, some difficulties, particularly with regards to things like the raising of loans. Uh, you know, the banks very often like to see a, a separate entity through which business, business is being operated. The ent as I've indicated to you as well, the entity principle applies for accounting purposes. So the tricky thing here is we've still got to try and separate the assets and liabilities of the owner and the so-called business. But again, it's a problem because the owner is the business. So it sometimes does create a little bit of a gray area and a little bit of confusion from an accounting point of view. Secondly, we have a partnership. A partnership would, of course, be two or more people uh, that uh, operate this business together. Uh, there is also, again, no legal separation between the partners and the business, but from an accounting perspective, the entity principle would still apply. We would still want to try and separate the assets and liabilities of the partners from the business itself. Uh, the partners are not employees of the business as such, because the partners are the, the owners or the partners in the business. What's problematic Okay, with a partnership, and I haven't actually indicated it on the slide, but what's problematic is that a partnership is a very weak form of business entity, and that's for two main reasons. In terms of our common law, each partner has what's called a mutual mandate. Okay, that means that a partner can act on behalf of the other partners. It's an implied authority that each partner has. So it means one partner can do something on behalf of the other partners without them actually being aware. And the second problem with a partnership is the partners have what's called joint and several liability. So if the partners, let's say, bought a property together and the amount of the loan repayment on a monthly basis is 10,000 Rand and you have two partners, A and B, it means that A and B are responsible together for the loan repayment. That would be the joint liability. And secondly, the partners are severally liable. So if A doesn't have any money, it means that B would, would be responsible for the full loan repayment. And that's a very, very big weakness in a partnership. It's one of the main reasons why a partnership is not a suggested form of trading entity. Close corporation I have just mentioned because they still exist. Most of you will be aware that for quite some time, uh, that's a number of years now already. Close corporations cannot be registered, but existing close corporations still uh, do operate as business entities until at some point in time they will cease to exist. So a close corporation uh, is registered in terms of the Close Corporations Act. This is a separate entity. Close corporations were originally established as a very light form of company type trading entity. It's considered to be a separate legal entity. Uh, one of the important things about a close corporation is that the members, so in a close corporation you don't have shareholders and directors, you have members, the members are the shareholders and directors. The members have what we call limited liability. It's not the close corporation that has limited liability, it's the members that have limited liability. That means that the members are not responsible for any debts that the close corporation may incur. This is exactly the reason why when dealing with a bank, a bank's going to require one member or all of the members to sign surety for the close corporation's debts. That's, that's the case uh, because in the event that the close corporation cannot repay its debts, then the members would then become personally responsible for those debts. There are also certain requirements that a close corporation has from an accounting point of view that these are less than a company. In terms of the New Companies Act, 
of 2008. It's not so new, but it's our latest company that, that we have. There are light forms of companies that can be created, which in many respects have similar type of characteristics to the old close corporation. Company, which is obviously a very well-known form of trading entity, it's a separate legal entity. Once again, the assets and liabilities of the shareholders are not the assets and liabilities of the company itself. It's owned by shareholders and it's governed by directors. Remember, for a close corporation, we have members. In a company, we have shareholders who own and we have directors who control. <coughs> of course, a director could be a shareholder as well. One of the main advantages of a company is that it has perpetual existence. It has an indefinite life. Uh, it doesn't have to come to an end. Of course, companies can be shut down, but a company can really survive the normal lifetime of its shareholders. And importantly as well is that shareholders have limited liability. So that means that the shareholders are not responsible for the debts of the entity, unless, of course, they make themselves responsible by assigning something like a surety. So once we have produced the financial statements, we now wish to analyse those financial statements. How do we go about doing that? Let's have a look at this quote that I've provided to you. Accounting has no other function than to produce reports on which economic decisions can be made. So really what's important about our financial statements is not so much the capturing of the data and the information that it provides. It's what we do with that information. It's how we analyse that information. That's, what, that's what's important. So we can then use that information to make economic decisions. So what we do is we analyse the company and we analyse and interpret the financial statements of that particular entity. The way in which we do this is primarily through the use of different ratios, and you'll see I'll refer to those ratios shortly. What we need to be aware of is that a ratio on its own can often be misleading or even sometimes dangerous to utilise. Really, when we look at certain ratios, and bear in mind, a ratio is just showing a relationship of something to something. For example, a debt-equity ratio. What is a debt-equity ratio? It just shows us the relationship between the entity's debt that it has and the amount of equity that it has. Or any type of... Uh, relationship that we're trying to illustrate in the financial statements. All it's doing is showing us something versus something else. Really what we should be doing to make this analysis meaningful is have an idea as to what are the various industry norms, so what's usual in that particular industry, and secondly we should really do this as an analysis of a trend. It's very difficult to look at a ratio in isolation if let's say we're doing this for the 2016 or 2017 financial year, really we should have access to what's happened in the 2015, 2014 and 2013 financial years in order to be able to give us an indication as to how things have changed. In other words, what is the trend? What has happened uh, in that business? And I've also said to you that balance sheet values can be misleading. The reason why that is the case is that the balance sheet or the statement of financial position is very often referred to as a snapshot or a photograph of the business. So if we are looking at a business's financial statements that have a year end of, say, February, and we're looking at February 2016 financial statements, and it's now November of 2016, those statements that we're looking at are completely out of date because it refers to the year from the 1st of March 2015 until the end of February 2016. So we're looking at some information that's 18 months or even older. It's out of date. What really we need to do is look at the most current information in order to make sure that we get a full understanding as to whether or not things have changed because the financial position of the business may have changed quite dramatic, dramatically or remarkably over that short period of time. The same thing, by the way, would be true for all of the other financial statements, for the income statements and the cash flow statements. So the main ratios that we utilise to analyse a business are divided into the following categories. First of all, we want to assess profitability. Second of all, we want to assess efficiency. Thirdly, we want to assess liquidity. 
And fourthly, we want to assess gearing. So what do all of these things mean? Well, profitability, as it says, we want to see how profitable the business is, and that would be for, for any business. Efficiency normally refers to how we manage our working capital. Working capital referring to our current assets and our current liabilities. So that generally is how are we manage, managing our debtors, our creditors, and our stock. Obviously, for an estate agency or brokerage type of business, that type of ratio may be less important. Okay. Liquidity normally refers to uh, long, longer term liquidity. So in the longer term, uh, how likely are we to be able to repay things like long term debt? And gearing refers to the amount of borrowed money or borrowed funds that we have. So our profitability ratios that we generally utilize are as follows. First of all, the return on owner's equity. So here we're having a look at the profits that the business have made, and we're looking at the amount of money that the owners have invested, and we want to see, so what have the owners got back as a percentage on the equity that they have put into the business? Of course, from the owner's perspective, why that's important is that the owners have an opportunity cost on their capital. They could have put that money into that particular business or possibly into a different business. And so hence they can assess the opportunity cost of making one investment decision versus another. Return on capital employed, so the difference between the two is your capital employed would be all of your capital, which would be equity as well as debt. And it would be a similar calculation where we would, we would take our profits and we would also then work that out as a percentage of our total capital that we have available. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to just uh, move on to the gross profit margin and net profit margin. Our gross profit margin and our net profit margin, would, we would calculate by taking our gross profit or our net profit and dividing that by our revenue. How do we know whether these percentages are good or bad? As I indicated earlier, really what we should do is we should look at the industry, we should try and get an idea of what the industry norms are, and we really also need to look at a trend and how these percentages have changed over a period of time. Our second set of ratios, I'm just going to uh, briefly have a look at these. As I mentioned to you, the efficiency ratios, uh, really what we're looking at is how well we manage our current assets, and our current liabilities, this refers to things like our stock or our inventory, our debtors and our creditors. And for an estate agency or brokerage type business, one shouldn't be having any stock because you're not selling any goods. And of course, the mandates that you're holding is not your stock in the sense of uh, holding uh, groceries that you may be selling. Um, and obviously, your debtors and creditors would be managed on a, on a monthly basis. Uh, your debtors would be people who owe you money, so they could be commissions owing to you, and obviously any money that you owe that you would pay uh, on, a, on, a, on a monthly basis as well. The liquidity ratios, uh, the ability of the business to meet okay, its short-term liabilities, uh, as well as its long-term liabilities. I just mentioned that to you a little bit earlier. As far as our short-term liabilities are concerned, we look at what's called our current ratio and our asset test ratio. Our current ratio, we look at the relationship between our current assets and our current liabilities. So we see how they relate to one another. Of course, our current assets should be more than our current liabilities. So the ratio would be our current assets divided by our current liabilities. And if you look at any textbook on the subject, you would see that usually the benchmark we use is two to one. So for every one, for every one rand of current liabilities, we would like to have at least two rand of current assets. Our asset test ratio, the formula for that is current assets minus our stock or our inventory less, uh, sorry, our current assets minus our stock or our inventory divided by our current liabilities and there the benchmark is one to one. Why do we calculate the asset test ratio? Because some businesses hold a very large amount of stock and that makes their current ratio look extremely impressive. Okay, the asset test ratio would be of little importance for an estate agency or brokerage type business, but really we would look at the current ratio to see whether or not our current assets are at least greater than our current liabilities to be able to service our current liabilities. 
we'll also have a look at our long-term uh, ability to be able to repay long-term loans as well. That would be part of our liquidity ratios too. And finally, our in investment type ratios. So we would have a look at some earnings ratios, dividend ratios, and net asset value per share ratios. These, of course, would be important for entities like companies. So our earnings ratios, uh, we would have a look at things like earnings per share. The earnings per share would be our profits that we make divided by the number of shares that we have, our dividend ratios that would be assessing the amount of dividends that we're paying out and our net asset value per share we would calculate by looking at the total value of our assets minus the total value of our liabilities that will give us a net value we take that net value and divide by the number of shares we have to give us a net asset value per share finish off our presentation let's have a look at how we would go about doing some budgeting for an estate agency it's obviously quite difficult during the course of this short presentation to be able to do this in a tremendous amount of detail. So I just want to give you, the viewers, some ideas as to how you would go about doing this. You'll see if you look at the slide that I have given an idea of some of the types of numbers that one may be dealing with. You'll see I've said to you, you run your, your own agents, your brokerage, and you have the following monthly expenses. You have rent of 8,000 Rand per month, telephones of 2,500 per month, administrative staff salaries of 8,000 per month, stationery and consumables of 1,500 Rand per month, and advertising of, let's say, 15,000 per month. One could, of course, add whatever other expenses the agency or the brokerage may have. Let's have a look at some of the questions that I've posed to you. So I've said to you, if you are able to achieve a gross commission, of 7.5% on each and every sale that your agents make, what is the value that your agents need to sell every month in order to cover your expenses? questions that I have posed. If you're able to achieve a gross commission of 7.5% on each and every sale that your agents make, what is the value of the property that your agents need to sell every month in order to cover your expenses? I've said to ignore that and assume a 50-50 split between your agents and the agency. Obviously this particular percentage you would have to work out for your particular agency or brokerage I know some of you watching this presentation may be laughing at the percentage that I've utilised because you achieve a lower percentage. Whatever that is, you would work out what your average gross commission rate is. It may be 4%, 4.5%, 5%. So whatever it is in your particular instance. You would then add up all of your various costs. So if we know, for example, that our costs are 50,000 Rand per month, and we know that the gross commission that we generate is 5%. So how much do we need to generate in order to be able to cover that 50,000? So what does 50,000 represent 5% of? Well, let's work it out. So that would be a million rand. 5% of a million rand will be 50,000. So therefore, we need to generate a million rand in in, in sales, and we would need to sell a million rands worth of property to generate 50,000 rands worth of commission. But don't forget that the split is 50-50 between ourselves as the agency or the brokerage and our agents. So if we generate a million rands worth of property transactions or sales on a 5% commission rate giving us 50,000, we still have to split that between ourselves and our agents. So therefore we would need to 
make 2 million rands worth of sales to give us 100,000 rands worth of commission, which would then be split 50-50 between ourselves and the agents. Secondly, I've said if your agents are able to convert 6 out of every 10 listings into a sale, how many mandates must your agents take on a monthly basis? Again, we would then obviously need to know, so what do we need to generate in order to be able to cover our expenses? Remember, we're not even including a profit here. How much do we need to generate to cover our expenses? And, of course, we also need to know so what the gross value of our property transactions would be. We could then do this calculation and we could work out, well, if our agents convert six out of every ten listings into a sale, we know what the average value of property is that we sell. We can then work out, so how many listings do we need to take in order to be able to achieve that two million rands worth of sales that gives us the hundred thousand rands worth of gross, gross commission, which we then split between ourselves and our agents. Assume that of the six sales mentioned above, on average two of the sales commissions are received two months after the date of sale, two are received three months after the date of sale, and two are received four months after the date of sale. Plan a cash budget for yourself from January to December. So one could obviously take all of this information and based upon how the commissions are received, that one could sit and either do this manually or you could pop it onto something like a spreadsheet and you could then clearly see for yourself over the course of a particular period of time what your anticipated income is going to be during the course of that particular year, in this case from January to December, less what your monthly expenses are going to be, and you can then see what you estimate on a monthly basis will be either your surplus or your deficit. So are you going to have uh, your income being greater than your expenses, or are you going to be in a position where your income is less than your expenses, and you then have, have to find a way of making sure that you can cover those uh, uh, shortfall, that, that particular shortfall that you may have. That brings us to the end of this particular presentation. I wish to thank you for your time. Please remember that you need to complete your 10 multiple choice questions in order to obtain your CPD points. Once again, should you wish to contact me, you can refer to our website, which is www.cpmd dot co dot za or you're welcome to send me an email my email address is graham at cpmd dot co dot za all of these details were at the beginning of the presentation thank you